but Randori is an educational experience. And the hardest thing to lose in Randori is one's ego. Welcome back to the Gojuri Karate Center. This morning we're going to run through some more drills on how to slowly and gradually improve one's randori. Before we go on, some reminders. Number one, randori is in different schools done different ways. So do what your sensei says. In our school, the tendency, or in our dojo, the tendency is to develop a system of fighting that includes any and every possible technique, so anything goes. Secondly, it is done slowly at the very beginning for everybody, and it is gradually built up over time. The encouragement is to try and bring something in that is bits of your kata, but randori is an educational experience, and the hardest thing to lose in randori is one's ego. So that is the most important point I'd like to bring up. Slow control, no ego. It's not about who is the better fighter in this case, it is about learning. And we use Randori as an educational tool rather than let's separate out who's the best and who's the worst. Okay, so without any further ado, hey Brian, let's go. Onigashimasu, let's come this way a little bit. Um, in previous videos, we've done drills where it's been punch and hook and hammer fist, etc. And we've been concentrating on the defender. And the idea being that the defender starts to move his feet and starts to block and is constantly trying to get away from this forward-backward logic and starts working towards an outflanking flanking logic. This morning, we're going to be working on the attacker. So we're going to stand and Brian is going to simply block the first technique. So I'm going to start everything with a punch. So Brian, hands up. And so as I punch, Brian is going to block. Now I get two more attacks. So what will be the next attack and the next attack? So we'll do this as a drill. So if I punch with this hand, Brian will block. I will not pull it back and make a separate technique. From this point, forward, forward. All right, so punch, elbow, hurricane. Punch, elbow, hurricane. Okay? So this is a drill. And you do it with your partner. Now, my partner gets the ability to block two of the techniques. So as I do one, he now does the second one. And there's the third one. So one, two, three. One, two, three. And where we're going is that we're not going one, two, three. But rather that if my hand is entangled, how do I build continuous attacks? Because I'm not obsessing, I'm not fighting with this I have to get this punch to hit and I'm going to force it through. At some point, somebody's either going to move or block or do both and you're going to miss. So where is your adaptive skill? Okay, so we've done one, two, oh, there we go, Brian, block it, and three. It's a simple idea. All right, so next kind of idea. And this is where you need to play with whatever works for you. So if I do my punch, all right, now I'm going to change this to maybe a high toe and a hammer fist. So punch, high toe, hammer fist. 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 You can see Brian's already blocking the second one, and we can build it like this. So we've got a second drill. And again, we've started on the punch. What happens if I start with the hook? So, I take the hook, Brian does the hook. Oh, hold on Brian, let's do uppercut, elbow. Okay, and there's a change in stance. So I do hook, uppercut, elbow. Hook, uppercut, elbow. 
So Brian does block, block. Now maybe I change it because there was no ways of doing this against. So that's going to be a good block for him. But now, one. Obviously my face is open and it's still a drill. So hook, uppercut, elbow. Hook, uppercut, elbow. And we're building. It's this adaptiveness that we're looking for rather than now I have to use this hand, have to use the leg, have to use the leg. The idea being that you're going to work towards building a fluidity in your attack. So it's not going to be that single solitary attack with the sole intention of that single knockout moment or that ippon moment like you would see in sport karate um, where you'd hold, poise, launch, clock him and then be like, yep, done. Yes, it has a place, but it doesn't fit in with the idea of continuous fighting. And we all know after watching lots of very, very entertaining UFC and in South Africa we've got EFC, uh, which is our African version of, of the UFC, that many very good fighters, very, they can take a hardcore shot to the face and they're going to stand up and just keep on going. And you can't rely on Iken Hisatsu, you can't rely on one punch victory. Sometimes you need that variety of blows that basically chip away at their defense. And so this kind of ties in with the principle in Randori of fluidity and it's not this hit and step back and reset because I've, I've got him. But that I've hit and that there's a possibility that he's going to attack and I need to continue moving because it is not over yet. And this is part of the logic in Randori. I think there are many facets. It's like a diamond. You literally have different facets on a diamond. It's not just cut with one single facet. The next idea is a slightly more advanced. So you can take that idea of three attacks and letting your partner block one, then block two, and then try and get them to block all three. The next idea is something that I do quite frequently in the dojo. I put my hand behind my back and I tell my partner, your job is to defend, all right? My job is to get through with one hand. So Brian is gonna defend, I'm fighting one hand, shot Brian so some of the things you can start with is simply is it a closed hand working then do I bring my elbows into it can I use my elbow to help create an opening the next thing is grabbing on and then using the grabbing on to help you improve. So we're doing things like this. You can break these down, you know, if you want to simplify it, you could stand with your partner and go, we're here, I'll change your legs please Brian, it's better for the camera. One, two. So pull, strike with the same arm, pull, punch with the same arm, block, elbow. So use the elbow like a, a block to create the opening and then what's the natural extension thereof? This. If he blocks then that flows. And so the idea is this continuity. By taking one hand out of the equation and forcing myself to think and to flow from here, where's the opening, where's the opening, how do I create an opening, then I'm starting to get something special. So if I'm defending, Brian is going to attack, he can put one hand behind his back, off you go Brian.
So at this point, I am standing very still, and I'm trying to just govern the center line. So from a defensive point of view, I'm trying to govern the, the center line. So these are not my words. These are ideas from uh, Sensei Ronnie Kluger. He would often, when teaching about Randori, govern the center line. In fact, all kumite governing the center line and using two hands, if you can, if you have two hands, some people are not that fortunate, two arms governing that center line as much as possible. And then you have to treat every little punch and attack as if it could be fatal. So Brian managed to get two short punches into my stomach. That is catastrophic for me, mentally. I obviously have to deal with the fact that I didn't block and that the bottom hand wasn't doing enough on the blocking. But it is important to understand that you're trying to be critical of oneself in a way to improve your ability. So I am defending, Brian is attacking, Brian is working on the fluidity drill, I am working on governing the center line. At this point, because Brian is very frontal on his attack, I'm not moving around too much. So if Brian is allowed capacity or scope to move in a wider arc, hey Brian, so you can move around a little bit more on your attacks, off you go. I'm now Okay, so I'm now trying to maneuver myself and I'm still trying to govern a single point. I'm not really trying to move to outflank him because I'm obsessing with my hands. Now, if I'm allowed to move and take the ideas from the first couple of uh, drills that we did in our How to Do Run Dory, where I'm out maneuvering him and trying to outflank him and I combine the two then the randori becomes more and more circular it isn't this linear clashing but is very much circular I do believe that you need to take the principles that are being taught and that are held and are um, kept alive within the cutter you need to bring them into the sparring I think that is the, the higher purpose of martial art, not just the very flat, simple, uh, civil defense, I'm protecting myself, and if that's the case, I might as well do Krav Maga and just practice a pranch and a, a kick to the groin, and the rest of the stuff is just gonna be meaningless, okay? Because then why the heck do we emphasize cuts so much? There must be some reason, okay? Is it the artistry? Is there something in it that we're after? And I do believe that for a large portion of the martial arts community doing karate do of any ilk, it is about the artistry. It's about preserving the art as such. And for some people, it is about preserving the science, the uh, manifestation in physical combat. So I think We've got to work towards something. I think somewhere along the line, I definitely think a lot of stuff has been stonewalled out. And over time, historically, um, maybe not as much was taught. And that there is possibly a very different uh, understanding of martial art pre, let's call it 1920 and post 1920. And then another change again post-1945. And so with that in mind, I think what most people need to understand is that the karate that you're practicing in your dojo today does not resemble the karate of uh, the 1910s, 1920s, etc. I think a lot has been lost. It's up to us to rediscover it. Uh, it's kind of misplaced. I shouldn't say lost. It's just misplaced. 
I think we have fantastically intellectual people out there who can reverse engineer it. And I think the purpose is to work towards the reverse engineered version. And then also to understand that it's evolving. So what was the epitome of success in 1910 might be rather elementary today. And that we aspire to something far greater is also not a problem psychologically. And again, it's just looking at that diamond and picking a different facet to view your martial art through. Uh, it's a rather deep philosophical undertone, but it's very important to have that with your randori and with your sparring. Um, to quote somebody I watched on a video, I sense Zoe is going to be annoyed with me because I'm not going to be able to remember where it was, but um, I watched a documentary on, on martial arts and in particular karate and uh, kung fu, etc. And the underlying principle is that martial art without an underlying philosophy is nothing more than a dirty street fight. And I think that is very important that you understand that there is an underlying philosophy behind what we're doing because we preserve the angry white pajamas, the uniform, the, the culture within the dojo or within the studio. And whether it's uh, sensei or sifu, it doesn't make a difference. You're preserving something. And therefore, there is some kind of underlying philosophy. That underlying philosophy affects everything. In our Andori now, we've been working on fluidity. We've been working on mobility a little bit. Now the attacker is working on mobility, and they're working on one hand. Now, where do kicks come in? That's our next facet. What do we do with the kicks? So we've been working on the idea that because of human nature and human development, um, upper body is far more dexterous and far more versatile than lower body. That's not to say that there aren't people out there who are fantastic exponent of leg work. But in our randori, we don't want to be trying to do five or six kicks in a row while we're holding our foot in space. Because it might just be because of the distance that we work at, it's far more beneficial to be using elbows and punches because we're so much closer in. So bearing in mind that it's a gorgeous style of fighting, we want to be closer, which means the kicks are not going to be long-range kicks, but rather close-range kicks. Long-range kicks have their place, and their place is to bring you in to that closer distance. In other words, it's the bridge. So let's go, Brian. I'll give you an example of the bridge. Brian is going to, we're far away from each other, kind of. He's going to bridge the distance because he can't get me with his hands. He's going to bridge the distance. He's going to do a roundhouse kick to my leg. And I'm, for the sake of being a tough guy, I'm going to take the kick on the leg and he's going to land and then he's going to go in with the hands. All right, that kind of looked kind of sporty. Um, so make sure you shift up into something like Sanchen Dutch and that you're getting to that close quarters. Okay, so he does the kick again and he's coming in. All right, so that's one idea. The next idea is that the kick is used to unbalance the person. So if we're in this kind of position and there's hands and now I'm using my leg to attack and to unbalance him or to unbalance him, to bring him forward. And you'll see a lot of videos by, say, Paul Enfield and Michelle Enfield where they discuss this and this idea of a close quarters kick. Obviously, the next thing is just simple distraction. Get his brain there and take him on the head there. It's kind of like a sport base where you'd see the guys do tap and then either a front foot kick or tap and a punch, okay? But there's this natural thing of what's the purpose of this tap? Obviously, our cousins who do full contact, koi kishin, the kicking on the thighs, kicking on the legs. Do we want to be standing and taking all of those blows? Obviously not. So either move or block. How much of it should you be doing? I reckon about, at best, 20%. Let's work on the 80-20 rule. 80% upper body, punches, strikes, elbows, okay? 20% 
kicks, and knees. And then your andouri is going to start taking on a slightly different flavor. Okay. Hey, Brian. I think we're going to wrap it up as a basic introduction into the attacking facet and fluidity in randori. So this might be our third or fourth video on randori. And again, it is a process. We're going through a process of trying to build various facets of the complete picture. So that when we get given free reign in the dojo and sensei says, line up, bow to your partner, randori, begin. You know what you're doing and you can work with your partner and you can both grow. If Randori in the dojo, uh, Sensei says, uh, Randori is anything goes, fighting, full speed, full power, everything, cool, then you're gonna have to realize that this is very low on the scale of skill sets to help you develop uh, that kind of mentality for that level of Randori, okay? Take it where we're coming from. Our Randori is continuous, slow sparring, for lack of a better word, and it is an educational experience. You should both leave the randori environment uh, having learned something and having tried something different. That's the other thing. In randori, the expectation is not to work on things you're good at, but rather to work on things that you're not good at and to build upon it. Okay, that is it for today. Brian, come and think about. Hey. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and have an awesome weekend. Sayonara.